superheroes. I'm Pink Phoenix coming to you from Purdue University's College of Veterinary Medicine with Vetty Humans Live and our special guest, General Health. General Health's a physician, and today we're going to talk about why it's so important for physicians and vets to work together to help keep everybody healthy. Thanks so much for being on the show. I am so glad to be here with you today, Pink Phoenix, General Health here. Um, but right now, I, I'm uh, in my alter ego as the, uh, as the former Surgeon General of the United States. So uh, I don't have my cape today, but, uh, but I do have it with me when I'm out there promoting health. And hopefully you'll get to see the picture. All right. <laughs> Before we get to the tough questions, can you tell us a little bit about your story? Well, um, I actually grew up in rural Southern Maryland on an old farm, and uh, I had really severe asthma when I was younger. Uh, one of the things that I most remember about being uh, young was that I always wanted to have a pet. Um, I always wanted to have a dog or a cat, but I was really allergic to cat hair. And um, for our dogs, um, we were able to at least get an outside dog and keep a dog um, outside. But, uh, but a lot of, uh, I think, benefits from, from having animals around. Uh, my, my dog, Bruno, was my buddy growing up. And uh, I think I learned a lot from, from him. And uh, hopefully, uh, he, he, uh, he learns a few things from me. But, uh, but grew up in that, in that area and then had the good fortune of going to another Big Ten school, University of Maryland. Um, not, not Purdue, but, but uh, now a Big Ten school. And I uh, got interested in uh, pursuing medicine. And so I went to medical school at Indiana University. I was making my way slowly to, uh, to Purdue and, uh, and got my medical degree there before uh, becoming Indiana State Health Commissioner and then Surgeon General of the United States. And uh, now I'm here at Purdue University and uh, couldn't be happier, um, couldn't be happier to uh, be part of the League of Veta Humans and to be promoting health. Um, particularly One Health, uh, the concept that we're all interconnected, humans, animals, the environment, um, everything impacts our ability to be healthy. I love your story, and I think it's really cool. We both grew up in Maryland. We both came to Indiana to go to medical school, and then you, know, you became a physician and the Surgeon General of the United States, and I became a hog vet hosting a podcast that you're on. <laughs> I Life love is it. wild. I love it. <laughs> so you told us a little bit about what One Health means to you. Why do you think it's so important for physicians and veterinarians to work together? Well, one of the things that people don't know about the Surgeon General of the United States is that when I'm not on TV, when I'm not out there telling people not to smoke, you know, um, or or, uh, or many of the other things people um, associate with the office of the Surgeon General, that uh, I am actually uh, the operational head of the Public Health Service, the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps. And that is a, a group of 6,000 uniformed officers um, whose mission is to promote, protect, and advance the health and safety of our nation. And that's our overall mission. But uh, under the Surgeon General, you have doctors, nurses, pharmacists, veterinarians, dentists, engineers, therapists. Um, there, there are many different people who have to come together. So the public health service, as much as anyone, really believes in and promotes One Health. Um, we believe that you have to have uh, all these things coming together to protect the public's health. And, and so uh, one of the things that I try to help people understand is that we're all part of a team. Uh, we're, we're all, we, we all have to, uh, to do our part. And I learned this, for instance, uh, when I first became Surgeon General, uh, we had three Category 5 hurricanes barreling down on us. Uh, and they hit mostly the southern U.S., Florida, Texas, uh, but the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. And I, I flew to uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands and to Puerto Rico to do a tour, and the island was just devastated. I mean, completely devastated. But when we were going around the island, the needs, uh, quite honestly, weren't medical needs. I was a doctor, and there weren't a lot of acute medical needs. The needs were, hey, uh, what do we do with our injured pets? Um, or, uh, or what do we do with all these stray animals now? Because people had to leave 
the island and abandon their pets. Um, what do we do um, with with um, with with uh, food that's been sitting out and that hasn't been um, hasn't been properly uh, cooled? Uh, what do we do with a lot of the uh, mental health issues? Uh, it really was one health. Uh, personified, uh, and and it really showed the need to have all these different players at the table, just like a superhero team. Everyone's got their different strengths, their different powers that they bring to bear to uh, fight towards a common goal. That's an excellent example, and uh, it just me- must be so amazing to lead a team like that. It really was. It was a lot Incredible. of fun. And we have chief professional officers in every category. And so I got to know those folks really well. And um, I got to call on them. So my own dog, her name is Bella, got bitten by a snake when we were out in Maryland because uh, Maryland has more poisonous snakes than what Indiana does. And uh, she uh, ended up going to the hospital and I ended up having to call the chief veterinary officer emergently one weekend to help us uh, really navigate that difficult time for our family. Uh, Bella almost didn't make it. She was in the ICU and we thought we were going to have to put her to sleep. But fortunately, I had access to a to a uh, veterinarian who was able to help us understand and think through the proper care pathway for her. And I will tell you, again, that's another example of One Health because it was Bella's health that was at stake, but my kids were devastated. Uh, their mental health was impacted. Uh, it really in, in impacted our entire family um, you know, w- with what she was going through. And she made it through. So Bella's actually uh, upstairs now barking. You might hear in the background. And uh, uh, she, she's got some uh, some more gray hairs for, for the experience, but, but she's still doing just fine. Uh, and, uh, and again, my family is, is in a much better place for it. Uh, we know that, that having pets and having animals, not just pets, but animals around you can help lower your cortisol levels, lower your stress levels, um, can, uh, can, can be a companion that actually lowers people's chances of suicidality or of substance misuse. So uh, again, uh, and, and I say not just pets, um, going out and, and, and having a, and riding a horse, stroking an animal, uh, being able to engage um, with, with, with other animals really is calming. It's soothing for us. Yeah, the human-animal bond is so, so strong. Well, I'm glad Bella's okay, and maybe she can be the guest on our next podcast. Well, I, I know she would love <laughs> it. Bring so it down. Just, just like many people's pets, um, Bella thinks that she's a human. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so she would sit right in my lap and look in the camera and try to interact with you. That would be great. (laughs) Well, one thing I love about how you do your job is you're so engaged with the communities that you serve. So my question is, if you were in charge of the universe, it's actually two questions. What three things would you ask people to do to help get the pandemic under control? And how can we address the most common barriers the people are facing that prevent them from doing these things? Well, those are great questions. Um, I don't know if I'll if I'll get to three or if I'll have more than three, but but let me get started. I think the first thing that I would do is uh, take the politics out of out of all of the uh, the discussions. So, honest truth, uh, we got a double whammy last year. We had a once in a century pandemic, and we had an incredibly divisive presidential election. And no matter which candidate you were for or maybe you were for neither candidate. Um, It's hard to deny that it was a divisive presidential election and a lot of the debate that we were having about health really was being um, had through a inherently political lens. What do I mean? If I say you should wear a mask or if I say you shouldn't wear a mask, um, inherently you start to think, oh, that person must be a Republican or that person must be a Democrat versus thinking, what are the reasons, the scientific reasons behind why that person feels that way? If I say I'm pro-vaccine or um, no one should be made to get a vaccine, again, you start to fall into uh, the uh, these political framings versus scientific framings. And what's the lesson there? So I'm going to answer the second question now. How do we overcome that? We know that politicians speaking on these issues um, really lower people's trust 
um, in, in science. What we need are trusted people within the community talking about these issues. And who better than a veterinarian to go out there and explain the science behind vaccinations and help people understand, hey, you bring your dog in. We just took, we actually just took Bella, our dog, to go get her, get her updated, get her vaccines updated last week. So who better than a veterinarian to say, here's why we're giving Bella vaccinations and to teach um, young people and old people about, about how we develop vaccines and the science behind them and how they keep us all uh, safe. You can't take your dog to the kennel if you, uh, when you're going out of town if you don't have proper vaccinations. That's not to protect your dog. That's to protect the other people in the kennel. So we even know about, I mean, the whole concept of herd immunity comes from the animal world. So I think one way that, that we help overcome these challenges is by having experts, um, sci- uh, people who are trained um, as veterinarians, as doctors, as pharmacists, as nurses in the community talking about these issues instead of politicians talking about them. I think we need to educate um, people about um, about some of the things that 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 uh, have come up during this pandemic, not just vaccinations, but just about how to critically look at data, how to understand, OK, um, this study came out. Um, how do I how do I interpret it for, for my life? How do I apply it? In real life, what does it mean when a study comes out and says masking um, lowers the rate of transmission, or when a study comes out and says this new medication may uh, may may help you, or this new medication has been proven not to help you? And I don't want to get again political here. I can say one word, and, and people will immediately start thinking politics again: ivermectin. But I say it because we're on a veterinary podcast, and this is a medication that veterinarians use and know about. Um, an antiparasitic, well, who better than veterinarians to go out there and explain to people, look, there are indications to use different medications for animals and humans. And we use them in a scenario where we feel like the benefit exceeds the risk and to help walk people through that in a very non-confrontational, non-heated, non-political format. I think um, that uh, other things we need to do, uh, and I'm going to get a little bit... um, uh, non-scientific here, I think we just need to care for one another. Um, I think there hasn't been enough caring throughout this pandemic for one another. We've really, unfortunately, fallen in to this. It's all about me. It's all about what I want to do and, and, and not really thinking about, okay, what is the impact that my actions have on the broader community? And again, I go back to the fact that you can't take your animal to the kennel or to the dog park or around other animals without them, um, without having a reasonable assurance that they're not going to harm those other animals. So uh, why don't we hold ourselves to that same standard when we're going into a public setting? And it's not to say that uh, I'm advocating for for against any particular intervention, but the general concept that, hey, let's sit back and think that this is about more than just me. It's about protecting those around me so that we can have a, a civil and a, uh, and a functioning society. And the final point I'd make, and again, this um, ties back into veterinary science, is that, this, and this is a, a positive, uh, I, I want to remind people that we are really at a remarkable time scientifically. We're seeing science happen in real time. And we've had uh, three vaccines developed. We've had multiple therapeutics developed. We've had testing stood up. And all of, the, all of these things have happened in record time in record time, and that is great. And so what we need to do is take the good, the positives that have come from the last several years of the pandemic and figure out how can we scale those positives up to increase um, drug development in the future. Maybe we'll come up with cures for cancer more quickly or or a a vaccine for HIV because of it. Um, We remember that a lot of these diseases, including COVID, including Ebola, including HIV, have had animal origins. Um, including uh, Zika. And so um, how can we um, look at One Health and really um, look at what happened during the pandemic to figure out how we can more quickly identify these these diseases in the future and more quickly come up with tests and therapeutics and, if necessary, vaccines to prevent them moving forward. It's, again, by embracing a One Health approach. Absolutely. Oh, such excellent examples. Thank you for those. (laughs) 
So you are still practicing as a physician. Oh, as you see patients, uh, what are the most common concerns that you hear about from your patients about being vaccinated or boosted? Oh, so I thought you were going to ask what are the most common concerns I see in my patients. And I was going to say, <laughs> uh, it, well, I'm, I'm going to answer the question I thought you were going to ask first anyway, <laughs> because I think it's important because it's a problem that we also see in animals. The, the, the biggest problem, no pun intended, is obesity. And what's interesting is we're seeing obesity in humans. We're also seeing obesity in animals now as we are in a world where there is where there is more excess and where both people and animals are eating foods that are worse for you. Um, you know, we, we take our food and we get, you know, we order our fries from from McDonald's and we give a fry to the dog. Well, that's not good for us or good for the dog. Um, you know, and so uh, we need to really understand the importance of good nutrition because uh, it increases your risk for all sorts of diseases, for cancer, for cardiovascular disease, for diabetes. And actually, um, one of the top risk factors for being hospitalized and or dying from COVID is being obese. So if you want you to be healthier, your family to be healthier, your pets to be healthier, then we need to pay more attention to the food and the products that we're putting in our body. And we need to create more opportunities for people to make healthy choices because, again, I, I frame it through the lens initially of choices, but we ha have to understand that the choices people make are 100 percent dependent on the choices that they have. And uh, more people need the opportunity to make healthy choices. Uh, my dogs, my dog. I have two. Uh, Bella has a little sister now who we just got over Christmas named Ruby, but um, they love lettuce and they love apples. And so instead of giving our dogs um uh, treats that are unhealthy for them. Uh, we give them healthy treats and then my kids can eat the apples. They, they won't eat the lettuce along with the dogs, but the, the, the dogs love lettuce. I think because it's crunchy, <laughs> they'll eat the lettuce and they'll eat the apples and we're all engaging in good health. I want to go with this. <laughs> so we, we talk about this and this is so important because it's all about mitigating risk. And, and we talk about making healthy choices in people and animals. We also have to think about health disparities and not everybody has the access to make those choices. Exactly. So I am actually the director of health equity initiatives at Purdue University. And I have to almost always start off with explaining to people what equity is. <laughs> and equity really means people getting what they need um, versus equality being people getting the same thing. So um, let me give you a, a, a real example. Uh, if a person uh, is using a wheelchair, they may need a ramp to get in and out of a building. Uh, if a person is not using a wheelchair, they don't need the ramp. So giving everyone the same thing, either no ramp, um, means that, that, that you're disadvantaging someone who needs a wheelchair to get in and out of a building, or giving everyone a ramp means that you're actually misusing resources to give some people things that they don't need, um, doesn't get you to where you need to be. So equality is important in many instances, but it's not enough. Equity is giving that person who's using a wheelchair a ramp to get in, out, in and out of their home, um, giving that person who, um, who doesn't need a wheelchair another means to get in and out. And it may mean making sure that you're making the stairs readily available for someone who's at risk for obesity so that they have more opportunities to exercise um, so that they can be healthy. So it's really about giving everyone the, the opportunities to be healthy. And uh, I often like to tell a story about my daughter. My daughter likes to spend a little bit too much time on, uh, on these things. Uh, and so whenever she wants to, uh, want, is on her phone too much, I tell her to go outside and ride her bike, go outside and exercise. And I can do that because I live in a neighborhood where we know all of our neighbors, where we have co complete streets and sidewalks. And where um, she can safely, as a 12-year-old, um, go out and disappear for, for, from, from her family, from her dad, for, uh, for 15, 30, 30, 45 minutes at a time without us worrying that something bad is happening to her. Um, if I were to go just 10 miles away to downtown Indianapolis from where I, from where I live um, and do the same thing, 
I would be a bad dad. I'd be a negligent dad because these they, these aren't communities that have complete streets. These aren't communities that are safe um, for someone to go out. It's certainly not a place you tell your 12 year old daughter, go out and, and I don't want to see you for, for 20 or 30 minutes um, because then uh, all sorts of untoward things could happen. And the point of that is that um, not everyone has the same opportunity to make healthy choices. And we want to ensure that more people have that opportunity to eat right, to exercise, to sleep, um, to make make those healthy choices because we've made them the easier choices for them to go down the easier pathways. Another example, I talked about the apples and the lettuce that I love to give to my dog and that we love to eat too, that I love to give to my kids. Well, why is it that a bag of apples is more expensive than a bag of French fries at the store? Um, you know, if you don't have money and you're just trying to make ends meet, then you're in many cases forced into making an unhealthy choice because the unhealthy choice um, is the less expensive choice. It makes your money go further, even though it puts your health at risk in the long run. We've got to do more to ensure, again, uh, healthy choices are available for everybody. Absolutely. All right, let's go back to the vaccination question. What are some concerns that people have about being vaccinated that might not be related to the science of the vaccine at all, just well, the situation they're in. Well, first of all, um, we have to understand that a, that a lot of people in this country uh, have legitimate reasons to be concerned, fearful of, distrustful of the government and of the medical system. When you look at the infamous Tuskegee experiments that took place in our country, uh, where back in the 1930s, the federal government, led by the Office of the Surgeon General, the office that I was in um, uh, just just a few years ago, um, denied black men treatment for syphilis because they wanted to see how it would play out in them over many years, over decades. And so this went on for 70 years. They denied these people treatment and watched them suffer and watched their families suffer. And even after they stopped the experiment 70 years later, they then um, it then took several more several more decades for them to apologize for it, for these uh, for these horrific experiments. And so uh, we can't expect that someone is going to then immediately trust the government when we say or, or, or the scientific community when we say we've got this new vaccine. We want you to take it much less. We're going to make you take it. And, and even in two years, two years isn't enough time to overcome um, decades over over a half a century, closer to a century of mistrust. That's just one example. Yeah, Henrietta Lacks. Yeah, Henrietta Lacks is another famous example of a of a woman whose cells were used without her permission for scientific experiments, um, and uh, they're now what what are used to, to produce many many of our many more of our medications today. Her, th- those original HeLa cells. HeLa means Henrietta. You know, is an abbreviation for Henrietta Lacks. So HeLa cells are used to generate new medications, but the, many of the medications we use were generated um, from experiments using cells that were essentially stolen um, from um, someone who was subjected to medical exper- who, whose tissues were subjected to medical experimentation without her permission. And so lots of historical reasons for mistrust that we have to first acknowledge. And the, what I do with people is explain to them, look, we have institutional review boards. We have a FDA process um, with independent people on an advisory committee. Uh, we have many different checks and balances in place now to make sure these horrific things don't happen again. So we, we have to ex- start with that. Um, but people also feel like the vaccines were developed too quickly. And so I take a lot of time oftentimes explaining to folks that there were no corners cut from a scientific perspective. It was a lot of red tape that was cut. There's a lot of regulatory red tape that occurs. Um, and it also, quite frankly, is just not cost effective for many drug companies to 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 take multiple steps at the same time, um, because if the drug doesn't pan out, they've wasted um, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, in this case, the federal government said, we're going to pay you up front for these drugs, whether or not they make it to market. And what people don't know is there were actually um, eight or nine different candidates that we had fully paid for in the hopes that we get one over 
uh, over the finish line. We were fortunate to get three over the finish line, but that was because we provided the funding to be able to uh, to, to to work faster, to hire more people, to build up the equipment, and to uh, and to do multiple steps at once. And that did and, and that was without cutting any corners in the process. It was just working more, you know, having more money to 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 work faster. Um, at the same time. And then people also will say, well, these drugs haven't, these medications, uh, vaccines haven't been tested long enough. I have to explain to them that in the history of vaccines, um, almost no one exhibits side effects more than a few weeks out from the vaccine. So it's not like a drug that you take and you may not see the negative outcomes of it for years down the road. Uh, with vaccines, all vaccines, if you're going to have a side effect, um, you're going to have it pretty early on. And we've been studying these vaccines for well over uh, two years now, and we've got hundreds of millions of people who've been uh, who've been vaccinated. Uh, hundreds of millions, uh, actually um, billions of people worldwide who've been vaccinated. So if there were a safety issue, we would see it now, a major safety issue. And so I want people to understand these vaccines are safe. These vaccines are incredibly effective. No corners were cut. And I finished by telling people I'm vaccinated and boosted. My wife is vaccinated and boosted. My two boys are vaccinated and boosted. And my daughter, who's not eligible for a booster yet, is fully vaccinated. So I'm not just telling you to do something because I um, want you to, to, to listen to me. I'm telling you to do, uh, I'm, I'm advising you to do something because it's what I have chosen to do as a doctor um, to protect me and my family. Excellent advice. Thank you for that. How have you in in your position as U.S. Surgeon General, in your position in, in your personal life, how do you navigate differences in opinions that people have about these methods of controlling the pandemic? That is a great question. And um, one of my favorite sayings, is that people need to know that you care before they care what you know. So you start off by listening. Uh, there's a saying that we were given two ears and one mouth for a reason. Uh, you're supposed to listen twice as much as you speak. And uh, I start off by, by listening to folks and hearing their concerns. And uh, when you hear out their concerns, in many ways, you can find um, alignment between what you're asking people to do and what they want to do. So Someone may say, for instance, look, I want my kids to play sports again. And uh, then you then I can point out, well, there are other countries that have had that have much higher vaccination rates and much higher um, adherence rates to public health measures that are more open than what we are because they've been able to control the virus. Um, you know, uh, hearing people out, I think, is appropriate. Um, there are many people who've expressed concerns to me, even in the healthcare fields, about whether or not the vaccines impact their ability to uh, to have children, their fertility. And when you hear someone out and you hear those concerns, um, who am I to say that someone who wants to get pregnant is wrong for, uh, for asking that question? You're not wrong for asking that question. Uh, you validate it and you say that is a very reasonable concern that you have. What you should know is that we've actually done studies, um, many studies, that show that your risk of having fertility problems um, uh, it, it are, are much higher, much higher if you get COVID than if you get the vaccine. And that there has actually been shown to be no increase in miscarriages or fertility issues if you get the vaccine, but, but definite increases if you get COVID. Uh, but it starts out by listening. Uh, that same person who, who, you know, if you just heard them say, I'm, I'm not getting the vaccine, and you react and say, well, you're crazy, you know, or whatever pejorative term you want to throw out there, that doesn't engage them. That dismisses them. It builds mistrust and it actually pushes them away. But the way I respond is to say, OK, well, tell me why you feel that way. And then we, you know, then we can have an honest conversation and a compassionate and empathetic conversation about um, the real reasons people have hesitancy. And I found that when you take that approach, um, you, you, I'm often able to have success in, in helping people get to a place where they're more comfortable being vaccinated. I, I love that. And that circles right back around on why it's so important for you using your strategy and all of us to get in the community and listen to each other and support each other and care about each other and, 
and really understand the concerns because they are all valid. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I tell people all the time, you should never be ashamed and you should never be shamed for asking questions. What, but what we don't want to do is let misinformation cause us to make a poor decision for our health or our family's health or our community's health. So find someone you trust. Uh, find someone in your community. And again, it could be your doctor, your nurse, your local pharmacist, your local veterinarian, your local dentist. Find someone who has some scientific knowledge who, uh, you know, and some training and ask them, how do you think through these complicated issues? What are the sources that you go to for information? And, uh, and, and then that, that is a way, I think, to, to help you feel comfortable that you're getting unbiased facts, that you're not getting information from someone who has a political agenda or some other agenda. So I know that we have listeners out there who want to be veterinarians, but not all of them want to be veterinarians. Some of them, I imagine, want to be physicians. So can you describe the moment when you knew that you absolutely were going to be a physician? Ah, uh, That is a, a great question. And I'd love to tell you it was an epiphany, but it was something that I actually came around to very gradually, very slowly. Um, I loved science. I love STEM. And so uh, I actually um, think that, that of the folks out there, uh, a, a lot of people do believe that, that, it, that it's this magic moment and you all of a sudden know. But in most cases, people I advise, that's not the way it works. It's that you have an interest in science. You love learning. And that's, that's incredibly important. And you've got to learn. you got to decide, OK, do I like machines? And I go down the engineering pathway and I actually started um, off uh, majoring in engineering. Do I like machines and stuff or do I like to work with with live things? And, you know, in that case, you might go down the veterinary or or um, or or uh, or or traditional physician um, or uh, or dentistry route. Um, And if you choose to go down the uh, the working with with live animals route, then you've got to figure out which animals do you like to work with (laughs) The, the, uh, the, the kind that talk. Or, or, or the kind that cuddle, you know, and, 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 uh, and, and are furry. Uh, and then you got to figure out, okay, within that category, uh, is there a particular body part that I like to work with more than others or a particular subtype? So, you, you know, you work with hogs. And so I think it's just really about um, in the beginning, uh, figuring out broadly where are my passions um, and then kind of, uh, trying different areas out. So one of the things that, that um, folks can do at Purdue, which I love, is students can come on campus during the summer and and try out different things through different programs, take different tours in different facilities, and see what it's like to uh, to to be a veterinarian on a uh, daily basis, or to be a nurse, or to be an engineer. And I think that uh, that's something that I was very fortunate to have an opportunity to do when I was younger was uh, was go to different um, campuses during the summer. I went to a, a, an actuarial camp one summer. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, actuarial science is a, is a whole lot of math. Uh, actuarians are the people who figure out your insurance rates and they have to take 10 different exams uh, in order to, uh, to be certified as, a, as an actuary. Um, and I did a camp um, during the summer and I didn't hate it, but I knew I didn't want to spend the rest of my life doing it. And so I was like, OK, I like math, but I don't like math that much. So uh, um, what else can I do within the STEM fields that kind of scratches my edge? That's what I would um, recommend to people. And like I said, I started off in engineering. I actually um, uh, did a research project during a summer when I was in Holland with a gentleman who was an MD, PhD. And in his lab, he was doing some engineering work. And so that's why I was with him. But I got to follow him around as he did his hospital rounds. And I was like, huh, that's pretty cool. I actually I actually think I like that. And so it was through an exposure that uh, was almost accidental that I got to see what it was like to uh, be a physician on a day to day basis. And I would say that was the moment when things started to turn for me. And then I started having other opportunities or finding other opportunities to get more of that clinical exposure. Excellent advice. And there's lots of opportunities at Purdue and other places. I encourage our listeners, take advantage, try things, see 
what fits you best, what you love, and go with that. Because then life is pretty awesome when you're doing what you love every day. Exactly. I got a question for you. How did you decide to uh, to, to to specialize in hogs? Oh my gosh, that's it's so cool. It's so fascinating. Oh. I was terrified of hogs. So I grew up on a farm and we had hogs and we were always taught that the hogs were dangerous and we needed to stay away from them as kids. Um, and so uh, it's funny because uh, I, I know that's probably something that, that, that isn't pleasing for you to hear, but I was taught growing up to be afraid of hogs. Uh, and I just wonder how, how, do, how do you get into, uh, into that area? It was very random as well. I grew up in Baltimore, so I'm a city kid. I touched my first pig at the Baltimore Zoo when I was 21. So it was the first time I'd seen a pig and they were labeled pigs. So we knew what they were. (laughs) (laughs) And I came, I wanted to be a teacher and I thought I'd specialize in surgery. I was going to be a dog surgeon because the only thing I liked in school was shop. I loved metal shop and wood shop. And I figured surgery was like shop and came out here and I didn't really like surgery and I wasn't very good at surgery and I was working to pay for school and I worked for the swine group Hmm. and just doing clerical office work and there was one day that they needed help at a hog farm and they asked me to come out and I just fell in love as soon as I set foot on that farm I knew this was was what I was made for. Wow. You got the medicine, the herd health, the people, the engineering part, the ventilation, the management, the nutrition. It was all there. And the pigs are wonderful. Aww. They're just happy all the time. <laughs> well, they, well, they say happy as a pig. Uh, you yeah. know, <laughs> I, I love it. I, I love it. And I, I think, again, that's the lesson for folks out there is you just got to try different things because you never know. You, you, you may think you know what you want to do. And if that's the case and you actually end up doing it and loving it, well, good for you. But it's actually more often than not the rule rather than the exception that people go down a pathway that they weren't expecting or that, you know, they try something that they never thought they would like and then find out that, oh, that is something that I really love to do and could do for the rest of my life. So I need to ask. I want to hear about the time. When you got asked to be U.S. Surgeon General, what was that like and how did you make that decision? Well, uh, so what was interesting is that uh, I ran the Indiana State Department of Health prior to um, becoming United States Surgeon General. And so in that role, I worked for then Governor Mike Pence. Uh, Governor Mike Pence became a uh, Vice Presidential Candidate Mike Pence, and then became um, uh, Vice President Mike Pence. And so I suspected that I might be uh, asked to uh, to at least talk to folks about a number of different roles. Um, didn't think it would be for Surgeon General of the United States, but was, but was thinking that they might call me and ask me to do something. And um, uh, Mike Pence called me up one day on the phone and said, hey, um, you know, how are you doing? Um, uh, you may have heard that, uh, that, that we, we won this election, said, and uh, we'd love to talk to you about, about coming in and being part of the administration. And I said, okay, I'd love that. I mean, I was actually in Arizona when I got the phone call. And um, he said, well, how's about tomorrow? Because, <laughs> and I said, well, I'm in Arizona. Um, does it have to be tomorrow? He said, well, we're moving pretty quickly. So I said, okay, well, um, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to make it work. So I frantically, I was in Arizona for a different, for a conference and frantically um, bought a plane ticket to uh, fly out to, to New York City um, to go to Trump Tower and to, uh, to meet with the president and his team uh, the next day. <laughs> so setting up all these travel arrangements, frantic, you know, and, and the thing is, you're doing all that and you're also trying to think, okay, what am I actually going to say and do in this interview while you're also trying to figure out how do I actually get to New York and navigate, you know, in and out of the city. And it was the holiday season. It was, the, you know, um, November, December of that of that year because the election had just um, had just occurred. 
And so I, I went into Trump Tower and um, they had all the TV cameras rolling. And my mother-in-law calls me as I'm walking in the Trump Tower and says, I see you on CNN. Um, and she's calling me back from Indiana. And uh, I go up and uh, get off the elevator. And Newt Gingrich and, and his wife are standing there. You know, it's all these people, these names who uh, who um, you just would never dream of being able to meet in person, or at least I hadn't as a small town kid. Um, and I walked in and, and met with the president and had a conversation. And we talked about a couple of different positions. And I said, you know, um, I, I really do think that at the end of the day, um, probably Surgeon General would be the position that's the best fit for me. And uh, so that's how it went. And um, fast forward a couple couple of months after that, because the process went really quick and then it went really slowly. <laughs> it was July when I finally got a call back. Um, and this was, you know, the initial meeting was in uh, November, um, late November, early December. It was July when I got a call back saying, hey, um, we want to nominate you to be Surgeon General of the United States. And I was out of town again. I was actually in Myrtle, um, in not Myrtle Beach, in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, on vacation. And I remember this because I was out with my family at a go-kart track. In <laughs> Gatlinburg, Tennessee. I love go-karts. <laughs> and I get a call um, and, you know, and it says, um, caller blocked. And so you always, you know, <laughs> you know whether to pick those up or not. Um, but I'd been kind of waiting and I said, well, I better pick this one up. And so I'm at a go-kart track with all this, all this noise going around. And, um, and, uh, you know, I pick up the phone and it says, hello, is this uh, Jerome Adams? And I go, yes. Can you please hold to talk to the president? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, but I'm frantically trying to find a quiet place to have a conversation. And so that's when I, um, was offered, uh, the position as surgeon general. That's excellent. <laughs> All right, let's go outside of work. I know that uh, you like to race go karts now. Uh, <laughs> what <laughs> what other stuff do you do for fun? How do you manage stress? Well, um, you know what's funny is I, I'm not a, a huge fan of go karts so much as I'm a huge fan of spending time with my kids. So I have three kids. They are 17, 16, and 12. The two boys are 17 and 16, and the girl is 12. And uh, at this point, I will do just about anything that they're willing to do with their dad. So whether that's um, going on go-kart rides with my boys or playing golf with my older son who loves to golf. I'm a terrible golfer or, uh, do you know, playing soccer with my daughter. She's a, she's a soccer player. Um, my middle son runs track. And one of the, um, the coolest pictures I have of him, uh, he's actually a really good runner. And, and I actually um, ran track growing up. So I was a really good runner. Um, when he was about nine years old, he actually beat me in a 5k. Um, and that's how good he was. Uh -huh. And so there's a picture of me and him running um, at the finish line. And it, I, I got to defend myself here. So I could have beat him, but I was <laughs> running with him the whole time, pay, trying to pace him. And I thought he was tired. And at the very end with the finish line in sight, I turn my head and he takes off and he starts sprinting. <laughs> you know, he tricked me. And so I see him take off running and I'm like, oh gosh. And I take off running and someone snapped a picture of me and him sprinting towards the finish line. And he got across just before me and he'll never let me live that down. But, uh, but again, it's a special moment. And so uh, I think that to me, stress is about spending time with family and friends and uh, finding ways to be around the people who you, who you care about. I love that. That's really good. And I also love taking yeah. walks with my dogs. So, um, again, we have a, a new one, Ruby. And uh, so, you know, Bella's little sister. And uh, when I want to go out and relax, I love just being outside um, in the fresh air. And, uh, you know, having the dogs with me, I think, kind of uh, give me something to to, I love seeing them interact with the world because they go out and dogs are so cool. I mean, I, you can tell I'm a dog person, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> you know, they, they go out and everything's exciting to them. It's like, oh my gosh, a stick. Oh my gosh, a squirrel. Oh my gosh, what's this smell? And it's, uh, you know, it, you're like, oh my gosh, if, if only my life was that simple. <laughs> we have to make it that simple, right? We do. Enjoy everything as if it's brand new. <laughs> So before we wrap up, do you have an inspirational message for everybody listening? Well, 
you know, I, I have a bit of advice and then I'll finish with, I guess, an inspirational message. Um, my advice is to love one another, to care about one another, to remember that people need to know that you care before they care what you know, and to travel as much as you can. And your travel can be to another country, but sometimes your travel can just be to another community. As we talked about earlier, even 10 miles away from me, um, it's a very different community with a very different life expectancy and a very different experience than what my kids have right here where they're growing up. So going and volunteering at a homeless clinic or going, you know, or a homeless shelter um, or, or going and just seeing the world through someone else's eyes is incredibly important. Um, another one of my favorite quotes is by Mark Twain. He says, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry and narrow mindedness um, because you're actually starting to see the world through other people's eyes and it's no longer us and them. It's, it's okay. This is, this is what you're going through. Uh, but my, uh, I guess, inspirational message to people would be, I grew up as a kid who uh, was in a rural community uh, who didn't have many Black role models, to be honest with you, um, who didn't meet a Black physician until I was in college. Uh, I actually had good grades. I never dreamed I could be Surgeon General of the United States. Much uh, Never dreamed I could be a doctor, much less Surgeon General of the United States simply because uh, I just didn't know that that was a possibility for me. And so uh, uh, what I would say to folks is if I can make it from, from my background and surroundings to be Surgeon General of the United States, then there's really nothing that you can't do um, if you believe in yourself and believe that you, that, that you, that you can do it. And so um, don't let anyone tell you that you can't be anything that you that you want to be. Um, try to um, experience as many different um, professions and people as you can, because you never know what door might open or what thing you might like. You might want to be, you know, a, a hog veterinarian one day, or you uh, might um, be someone who thought you liked engineering or, or wanted to be an actuary initially, like I did, and end up being a doctor who becomes Surgeon General of the United States. So hopefully um, someone out there listening to this podcast will hear that, um, will remember that, and it will inspire them to try something new. Outstanding advice and very inspirational. I'm sure you've inspired many with this podcast. Well, you've been fantastic too. I tell you, I can, uh, it's obvious that this is not your first rodeo. Um, you, you, uh, you could be on, you could be on one of these big networks one day interviewing people too. You do a great job. Oh, thank you very much. The team effort, that which is what we talked about, right? Yeah, it's always the team. One health. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, General Health. Thank you. You can learn more about other League of Veta Human superheroes at vetahumans.org. If you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, and share it with your friends. And remember, use your powers for good. Mm-hmm.